romantic history is just Bobby. Oh, that's Frances. She's the writer. I'm Bobby. I'm like her muse. We were together in school. I want to muse. I don't operate exclusively. I haven't been with anyone else since. You have a crush on her. Obviously, I have a crush on her. Lenny, how are you doing today? I am all right. And yourself? I'm really good. Such a pleasure to talk to you again. Um, I've watched the first few episodes of the show. And one thing I'm, I'm going to get right into it is there's a lot of texting. And yeah. you would think that isn't very cinematic or very, uh, you know, visually interesting. And somehow this show has managed to make uh, text conversations properly like <laughs> there's like the cliffhanger of someone not replying just leaving you on red yes yeah. and there's, there's like well, uh there's i think there's second or third episode um joe's character just replies with the word yeah and i was like oh <laughs> I felt I know. That. <laughs> how difficult is it to uh to get across it's those really kind good, of scenes that's a really good question because like we didn't do any we didn't reinvent anything you know it's not like we found some special way of showing texts or whatever. Um, you know, we play on the characters' faces, we play on what's on the phone. I think it's always, it's always the same thing. It's always about like, is what's happening compelling? Is what's happening important? Are we inside the detail of the moment? Which is exactly what you're getting at when you say that word, yes. If you really know how she's feeling and what she needs from him, and that's the only thing that comes back, that can be really powerful. And I think it just, it proves something that I always believe, which is if you, if you, re, if what you're doing has, is coherent and there is that thread of like compelling, like forward momentum, however tiny, there's no such thing as like an inherently undramatic moment. You know, if you're inside it and it's significant, then you can show that's a difference. So with the text message, I think what we tried to do is just interrogate each time we're doing it so that it isn't just a lazy way of getting information over. And, and, and the bottom line is we all have to deal with it now as storytellers, because like that is so much of our lives is, is on mm. text based on various apps or like, so a few times we have, it'll happen later in the show. You'll have like voice messages because I would like, I'm so old that, uh, I think it was the first person ever sent me a voice message like that was Paul Meskel. And I right. thought, oh, is, he must have recorded something by mistake or, you know, and then I realized, no, this is what the young people do. They, yeah. they say things to each other and then send the message. And so we did a little bit of that. And then we do some of the sequences in the novel, which take place on email or on text, we have transposed into the real world. So we try to do, you know, those text moments when they're significant, when when the reaction of the person who receives the text or sends it is, is somehow, I don't know, meaningful. And I'm really glad you felt that way because it's just such a killer. I mean, you know, it's such a hard thing to deal with on screen these days. Yeah, like it was it was interesting because as you mentioned there, like there is so much weight carried now by WhatsApp and by Tinder and by everything like that. And so much of it can get lost in just the tone of because you're reading it and it's not how they necessarily wrote it so getting across it with the voice messages also helps yes um so we was start that in, in, in f3 i think we start sometimes to hear the voice of the person whose message it is so there's an email from bobby in episode three she's on her france on her way yes. home in the and we hear her voice and that's significant then yeah like that was one of the things i thought uh, that i haven't seen done a huge amount is just the uh I guess the weight and impact of you know technology and how how it does impact modern relationships. Um, sure. And the other one, and I'm sure you've you've talked about it uh, plenty, is that you know normal people tackled just sex in a way that a lot of shows didn't. Um, and in this, I felt that as well, but about sexuality specifically. Yeah. Um, and what I really enjoyed was that there wasn't there was a little bit from Sasha's character in like needing labeling, but like there's a lot of just forward thinking almost fluidity about it yes. and not necessarily labeled good or bad by anyone like yes. it's it's very open-minded which i really really appreciated yeah i think that's really important i mean it's one of the things that sally do has done so brilliantly in her novels you know and it was one of the reasons i was attracted to them in the first place i suppose was just going 
like the revelation for me of reading her books was both the familiarity, namely, you know, Dublin, uh, going to college. I, I had so many of the experiences that are in those two novels I relate to, but also the vast gulf that separates my generation from the generation of the characters she's writing about. Like the fact that they are not um, bom bombarded with like all of the sort of negativity around sex that was an absolute staple of the culture when I was growing up, you know, it's amazing. And I know there'll be people who go, oh God, it's so woke, everybody's so open about everything. And But actually, call it what you like, I don't care. It's just, it's healthy for me that people are open to each other in whatever way they present themselves. And that that, that expression of your desire doesn't have to be fitted into some sort of narrow category. So I agree with you. And I think as the show goes on and you watch more of it, you'll see that that, that idea of just honesty and love and compassion are the things that actually matter. The rest of it is all just, um, you know, as you say, there are a lot of labels floating around, but they're not that useful. Mm. Um, one of the things uh, and I think we'll get down in history is uh, how fantastically well cast normal people was between uh, Paul and Daisy. Um, for this, was there was there a particular character who you're like, that's going to be tough to cast? Or even was there a particular moment where you're like, I've got my four. I know exactly who I've got. Yeah. I mean, actually, from the outset, before we started casting, Frances was the one we were going, oh, like, she, you know, she's a character that resists like she was she holds herself back from situations so she's she can recede she's a sort of person i think we described it in the book in the actually in the show as like a person whose quietness is very loud you know what i mean the person who doesn't say much but really can dominate a room while not saying much and france like to do that as an actor is really hard like and and also her like crushing self-consciousness and like vulnerability and arrogance and all those things all mixed up together that vulnerable spikiness that she has however Alison arrived really quickly in the casting process so in fact the thing that I thought we all thought was going to be the hardest search she just announced herself really early as being this spectacular actor like just you know I feel so lucky I feel this about everything I've done you know you think well had I not found that person or those people Nobody will be talking about this. And huge kudos to Louise Kiley and to the Lear who continued to produce just the most amazing actors. Alison was just, she just graduated, I think. She never had a, a gig ever. Mm. Um, this is her first job. But then once we had Alison, it was then, then we, then it was like a long road to find the exact right combination of four people. Because it's really like Bobby is a really hard person to cast. If you think about, she's got this, like she's described as having this kind of massive presence, and yet you know that's just from Francis's point of view. There's a whole other side to her that we have to feel. And I think Sasha Lane has just got this, just such honesty in her as a character. You know, uh, she's she's much more kind of grounded than Francis, even though she's the flamboyant one in mm. a way. And then Joe Alwyn and Jemima Kirk, two brilliant actors who could carry that kind of, um, that sense of like being more established and at the same time, you believe the interest that exists between the older couple and the younger couple. Like it was a really, so by the time we got to the very end, it, it took a while. The feeling of, yes, we've got our people, I think was, uh, we did a reading where, I think Jemima was the last piece of the puzzle and I did a reading on Zoom where Francis and Jemima, Francis and Melissa, so Jemima and Alison were reading together. And there was just such a spark. And then we thought, great, that's it now. We're okay. We, 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 we might survive this. No, like there's, there's some moments in this and it, it really, it, it just, it's a testament to the acting and the directing and the casting where I'm like, I'm, I'm listening in conversations because they're real and I should not be listening to these conversations. That's great. Or, um, yeah, brilliant. And just one last question, and then I'll let you go uh, for now. But you can tell me, well, you, you can decide whether you want to tell me. It's, um, it's shocking to me that you haven't done uh, a big Hollywood movie yet. Is that because it's not of interest to you? Or is that because the offers that have come your way so far, you, you haven't felt a particular uh, passion for? I mean... I have not felt a passion for it, really. 
And it's hard, like sometimes, you know, there is a kind of, you know, you go, my kids think I'm insane. Like my daughter who's 11 and wants to be an actor and has all the crushes on all the young actors that you could possibly, you know, that you would predict. Sure, yeah. I, I, without going into detail, like if an offer comes in and I know, and, and it's, somebody is attached, you know, and my, my boy is 14 and loves every Mar- everything Marvel have ever done. And I, I haven't been offered a Marvel movie just to say that up front, but other things, right? Mm-hmm. And the kids are going, but, but, but you have to do it. Of course you're going to do it. Are you, are you insane? Are you mad? Dad, are you mad? And my thing is just, I have to be like, I have to be really into it to do a good job. I mean, you know, and I would never say never, but but I also feel like the world at the moment is the world generally is such a phenomenally interesting place. Mm. But most of and, and it's also a place with massive, terrible things going on. And it feels like a lot of the time when you go right up the budgetary scale, you sort of have to leave all of that behind and go into the world of pure spectacle, which has its place. And I'm not diminishing it. But it's just not, I don't know if I do it very well, I suppose, is the, you know, is the, is the honest truth. I think you have to be really into something to do it well. And the people who do those films really well, they love them, you know? Yeah. Has, the there, been one, a bit different. has there been one, like, a type of movie, I guess, that you, you've seen, you're like, I could do that one, maybe. Yeah, I think a really intelligent piece of science fiction which was character based you know is something that I can imagine doing which which, which might have the sort of scale to allow you to reach a bigger audience but mm. into which you could put some real thinking and real people so so that's the kind of like there's an there's a sort of small interlocking inter bit of the Venn diagram that like that would be a, a, a possibility I think and and so maybe, maybe I will. I, I started realizing, you know, life isn't, uh, you know, get, we all get older. And um, I always, you know, up until now, I'd go, oh, something like that might happen in the future. The future starts looking a lot more, you know, you can see how long the future is at a certain point. So who knows? But, but I'll, I'll see. Yeah. Like, I think the world would love to see Lenny Abrahamson's Dune. But yeah, I mean, I can, yeah. I mean, it would be fun. Like, there's no doubt about it. Um, but Dune is a good example of something where you, you know, I have seen films which I loved as a younger person that I thought, well, there's real value in that. And so you never know. Fantastic. Lenny, I could talk to you all day, I feel. But Me too. Time is cut off. We do it again. Thanks very much. Best of luck when the show launches and talk to you again soon. Talk to you again soon. Take care, Rory. I go inside out. You can see me now. Conversations with Friends starts Wednesday, May 18th on RTE1 and RTE Player. Hi.